The Greece that I knew as a young and aggressive poet has changed. Nevertheless, I feel there might be some point in trying to recollect and perhaps recreate a little, a little bit of the Greece which is not finished yet and not gone for good, and whose ghost still rises up to afflict me from time to time. And you don't have to dig very far to find real bone structure so that it really is possible to disinter the Greece I knew as a boy of 23 uh, as effectively as the archaeologists have disinterred long lost civilizations. And it's with the same joy and pleasure one always finds oneself mentally doing precisely that. It was in 1935 that Lawrence Darrell went to Corfu, and this was the beginning of a lifelong relationship between the writer and his Mediterranean landscape. Darrell described the enchantment of his four Corfu years in his first island book, Prospero's Cell. Somewhere between Calabria and Corfu, the blue really begins. You feel the horizon beginning to stain at the rim. The sky seems to come a little nearer and into deeper focus and you're aware of islands coming out of the darkness to meet you. Aware not so much of a landscape coming invisibly over those blue miles of water as of a climate. Entering Greece is like entering a dark crystal. The form of things becomes irregular, refracted. Mirages suddenly swallow islands, and if you watch, you can see the trembling curtain of the atmosphere. Corfu is a sort of anteroom to Aegean Greece, a landscape lying up close against the sky, suspended on the blue lion pads of mountains. The town is all Venetian blue and gold and utterly spoiled by the sun. Its richness cloys and enervates. And across the rich screen of this landscape, many names, ancient and modern, offer themselves. It's supposed to be Prospero's Island, and the Tempest might be as good a guide to Corfu as the official one. The petrified rock of Mouse Island, whose romance of line and form defies paint and lens, as well as the feebler word, is said to be the boat turned to stone as a punishment for taking Ulysses home. Xenophon, writing of the Spartan invasion under Nesippus, records a paradise of fertility and cultivation, a paradise so rich in loot that it unmanned the invaders. Then in the 14th century, the island was given to the Venetians and stood as a boundary stone when the waves of the invading east burst into these green valleys and groves. Under Venice, she prospered, at least in forests, for the Venetians gave 10 gold pieces for every grove of 100 olive trees planted, until when they left, it is said the island possessed nearly 2 million trees.
Then in the 19th century, the French came and burnt the Golden Book, in which the names of the Venetian families were inscribed, and the aristocracy died in the flames, to be reborn, phoenix-like, in titles stiff and unreal as old brocade. For the British who followed did their best to reinstate the aristocratic tradition. Everything absurd, everything tragic, and everything gay has happened here. It's been a dowry for kings. Idiots like uh, Bonaparte decided to land on the fort and then didn't. Uh, Richard Coeur de Lyon passed on the way to Cyprus. I'm quite sure that it is Prospero's island in the sense that everyone falls asleep. The enchantment in Prospero is very Corfu. For example, the French came here and they decided it was so nice. They'd like to do the Rivoli. They did half of it, they fell asleep and left. The British decided it's so nice, it ought to be administered. They built a lovely government house. They brought the stone from Malta. Good architecture for once. British colonies aren't all like that. They fell asleep and left. Cricket lives on as independently as the patron saint does. It's a mysterious and satisfying ritual which the islands have refused to relinquish. To the Greek peasant's eye, the white-clothed players must seem like something off a Cretan vase. Soon after Darrell and his young wife had settled down in Corfu, his mother and the rest of the family followed. And their life is vividly described in Gerald Durrell's book, My Family and Other Animals. We needed sun, we needed sunlight and to swim, because after all we were colonials, you see. We'd been brought up in India in the sun, and that was really a, like a, a lack of iodine in the blood. And so we stuck a pin in the map, and Greece was then so much far the cheapest country in Europe. And in fact, we'd live awfully comfortably here for nothing. In those days, you got about 100 pounds advance for a book, which would give you something like six months freedom in Corfu, eating well and drinking well. I mean, on this terrace here, my mother potted up and down, uh, clucking like a hen, and worrying about domestic problems. Uh, it's terribly recent, our prosperity. I mean, I'm talking about, what, 1936, 37, 35 years ago, 30 years ago. The primus stove was the only source of heat we had, and it could boil a kettle in about four minutes, but it was dangerous, it often blew up. For the most part, you used charcoal, and it took 25 minutes to, to boil water. Everything was stretched out much more leisurely, and if you didn't have the means to make big wood fires and use them in your, in your kitchen arrangements, you went round to the, where they made bread, and for a penny, you could put your lunch into the baker's oven and go and withdraw it at one o'clock at lunchtime. The primitiveness had also a kind of simplicity which was the really poetic stuff. You began to taste your olive oil, you began to taste your bread, because it was being manufactured in front of you instead of Hovey's whole meal, which comes anonymously onto your plate in a big capital like, like Paris or like London, where you never somehow see a loaf being baked or being eaten by a child, half eaten before it gets home. But it proved other things uh, for me. It proved that you don't need a lot of clobber to live, that you can live with one knife, one fork, one teaspoon and one glass. And quite a lot of you can live like that. So you learn to live very frugally and very sparely. Um, important lesson, really. Ja, 
In the old days, special wells had uh, a sort of uh, special qualities. I mean, elderly people had a well that they preferred to another well, you know, rather like wine tasters. The notion of water becomes so terribly important because you're always half dying of thirst in this wonderful heat. You're not sweating very much in some curious way. You're dying of thirst all the time. And cool water, cold water, water of any kind is absolutely one of the elements. You begin to feel this ancient Greek connotation. Greece hits you with its long associations with the past. It reverberates like a, like a seashell the whole time. Identical islands uh, off Dubrovnik, for example, just as beautiful, they seem to hold nothing. The, um, the sort of flower bed of ancient Greek mythology is always at your elbow here. Um, it's, a great, it's a great seduction because you really do feel the presence of Aphrodite and the spirit of place. It's not sentimental to realize that out of every phrase that they use today, two out of five words are Homeric words. Uh, they come from Plato. One feels that, that life is capable of, of much more extension here than in big cities. I don't know how it is. As if, so to speak, we all had hundreds of lives to live and we only managed to arrange to live about three or four. There is either not time or there's not circumstance. But here you feel the possibility of, of living the maximum number of lives allotted to you, so to speak. The cat. Maro, 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 maro. Well, the people struck me as so fantastic. Um, a sort of as if Ireland had been towed down and plunked into the Mediterranean. Because it, it isn't Spanish, you know, which has a sort of somber quality. And it isn't Italy, which has an operatic quality. Uh, it has kind of innocent, wide-eyed, uh, passionate, wow. romantic craziness, uh, which went right to my heart. <laughs> Every occasion was an excuse for a celebration, and of course, weddings topped the lot, involving ceremony and glad rags and great revelry and dancing all night. In the old island costume, the villagers looked as colorful as a pack of cards. most galloping dancer was the giver away, it's the best man, and he has the best look in of all. He walks out with the bride on his arm and then the bride is taken away and then a festive dance is arranged, it's all very homeric. They themselves are not aware sometimes of the, of the uh, ancientness of their, of their customs. Um, but they are there as they go back through Byzance into, well, into really, to ancient life. Thank you. 
is never a performance so much as a common right, the transmission of an enigmatic knowledge which the musician has summoned up from below the earth. It flows outward through the dancing feet which are building the dusty circle stitch by stitch like a fabric being woven, step by step like a city being built. And the darker circle outside, the lookers-on, gradually absorbs the rhythm which triumphs over them by sheer repetition being laid down in the consciousness like successive coats of a thrilling color. One can watch the crowd being drawn into such a dance man by man, impelled by something like the gravitational law which decrees that autumn windfall should plunge towards the center of the earth when they arrive. expressions of their landscape, but in order to touch the secret springs of a national essence, you need a few moments of quiet with yourself. Truly the intimate knowledge of landscape. It's a pity indeed to travel and not get this essential sense of landscape values. You do not need a sixth sense for it. It is there if you just close your eyes and breathe softly through your nose. You will hear the whispered message for all landscapes ask the same question in the same whisper. I am watching you. Are you watching yourself in me? And most travelers hurry too much. Ten minutes of this sort of quiet inner identification will give you the notion of the Greek landscape which you could not get in 20 years of studying ancient Greek texts. But having got it, you will at once get all the rest. The key is there, so to speak, for you to turn. Of course, you cannot arrange to be initiated through a travel agency. You would have to reside and work your way in through the ancient crust, a tough one, of daily life. It is here that the travel writer stakes his claims, for writers each seem to have a personal landscape of the heart which beckons them. Well, the landscape is so various. Um, one, talks, one talks about it because one can do nothing else when one is here, but why isn't it Spain? Why isn't it Italy? It isn't, you know, it's something quite different. What is it, ultraviolet ray? No painter's got it, and we, all we word makers, are very dissatisfied with our renderings of it. It's not that quite. It's a mystery, and let it remain a mystery so that you keep coming here to find out what the hell it's about. Can it remain a mystery? Oh, yes, certainly. All the big elements, earth, air, water, fire, in the Heraclitean sense, are still here, and they remain very big mysteries. Solitude is built in here, and you're surrounded by it, not only nature's like that, but when you see the monks here, you realize it's positive. In other words, it's not a negative quality. You're not locked up in a cell. You come out to meet it. The monkishness is not a withdrawal from life. It's rather plunging into it. 
And I suppose the heart of life must be really quite empty. And the word is marvelous in Greek, monaxia, loneliness. It also comes from monk, too. The quality of quietness in the islands is, um, is um, marvelous because it's slightly bit sinister. I wonder, uh, are we picking up that Susurrus of wind in the trees here? Well, you hear that at night and so on. Uh, you're on the Key Vive, rather like you are on safari, because it could be a lion breathing, and it's grease breathing. It's just that little touch of anxiety which gives the real quality of this island. Listen. And that reminds me, it's siesta time. Afternoon. The whole countryside folds up like a flower during the midday hours. The self-respecting husbandman and townee alike prefer a carefully shuttered room to the intensity, the silence and the brilliance of the southern afternoons. It is a weird time of day when everything seems to succumb to the silence, everything except the tireless cicada. It's the hour when Pan takes his rest. Hence, the haunting fear of the tree's shade, for no laborer will sleep under the shade of an old tree or one that is supposed to have grown a spirit, for it is here in the shadows of trees at crossroads by running water that Pan's assistants, the contemporary Naraids, lie in waiting. The patron saint is called Saint Spiridion, but the island is really the saint, and the saint is the island, for nearly all the male children are named after him. Here, in the church of the same name, Venice and Byzance compete in silver and brass, in bronze and in iron. It's fascinating to watch him being bargained with because, in fact, most of the praying is done on a strictly bargaining nature. Well, I'm giving you a couple of candles. Now you come on, show a leg and get me out of this mess I'm in. That tone of voice, which is uh, not what we call prayer, which is beseeching and propitiating, etc., etc. It's rough stuff. And he does come out. He cures plagues. He does almost everything. He's dispersed fleets. He's dispersed chicken pox. He's dispersed children. He's done everything. It's most amazing. I'm very fond of him, and I always carry a small amulet with me, and when I'm in trouble in Los Angeles, I always put it up and pray to it, and I say, listen, you old dog, get me out of this one, and I promise you, when I get back, you'll have a golden harp. Lawrence Durrell and his wife, Nancy, took a house in the north of the island. Here, at the shrine of St. Arsenius, Durrell wrote his first major novel, The Black Book. Because of censorship, it couldn't be published in England. However, due to the encouragement and support of his publisher, T.S. Eliot, and his friend, Henry Miller, it came out in Paris in 1938. It was finally published in Britain in 1973. <laughs> Parallel to the rather rocky life I was living was a frightfully intense interior life, which was centered more or less on trying to shape myself into some sort of artist, which is harder than you may think. 
Other countries may offer you discoveries in manners, or law, or landscape, but Greece offers you something harder, the discovery of yourself. My wife and I spent several summers quite alone here, the two of us, in this little bay, under the protection of the saint, who I must say has always been very kind. Saint Arsenius, good morning. After so many years, I come to ask you for another favor. Otherwise, he might muck up our filming. I'll ask him in Greek to lay off. Aios Arsenios, namas voitiste na kanome mia kali dulia ya din Elada. He looks all right. Looks a bit like Freud. The icon was washed up here in the middle of a storm, and it was found floating in the bay. Somebody came down, a peasant looking after his olives, and found the icon, took it to the priest, and the priest decreed that there should be a little shrine built here for him. He doesn't seem to figure in the list of saints, but then there are quite a lot who don't. They're local saints, spirits of place. It's my second birthplace. You know the, um, the old Indian notion that one's born twice, once physically, and then once you sort of wake up to reality. I think it's particularly true of poets, or of writers, let's say. Uh, here, it's, a, it's, quite, it's exactly the place where I finished off the Black Book and got my first poems together, and where I sort of discovered my own voice, in a way. It astonished me more than anyone else. But it proved also that I could write, which it, well, hadn't been clear before. You see, my other books were jolly nice anthologies of all the writers I admired. You know, two pages of Huxley, one page of Robert Graves, a bit of Richard Aldington. Uh, I was skillful, I was habile, I was able. But that wasn't quite what I was after. I wasn't me. And in the Black Book, I am me, for better or for worse. You must imagine the sort of extraordinary luck of a young man who comes to a place as remote as this, cuts himself off completely to find that his editor was T.S. Eliot, uh, that an anonymous writer called Henry Miller was anxious to see his work and to praise it indeed. But it took an awful long time until you actually could live off your craft. Oh yes, 25 years, you could say. But uh, that's very normal. I've had to lurk about in the BBC and as a school teacher and as a, as a false diplomat and so on and so forth in order to keep uh, the bread coming in. Did this make you bitter? Uh, well, I tried. Uh, the point is, it was a good waste of time in some ways, but I kept it an open notebook. I took uh, an example from Stendhal, who never wasted a trick. And it all came in very useful, because sometime, sometime later, when I did the quartet, I needed diplomats. And you know, when you haven't actually seen one uh, uh, close to, it's very hard to, uh, to fake one, you know. Most people um, uh, find it very, very difficult uh, to to get a reality. If you've never lunched at Buckingham Palace, it's awfully difficult to describe. You know, you have to fudge it. Well, I have fortunately seen diplomats very, very close, and I realized that if you poke them with a finger, sawdust came out, and you could get that impression when writing about them absolutely perfectly. But you have to be close. <laughs> Salasa See, you youth swallower, O poison-bearing element sea, 
Who makes our island folk always to be wearing their black? Have you not had enough of it yet? See, in all this long time, with all the bodies of the young you have swallowed up down into your insatiable maw. You wrote a lot of poetry also on Corfu, didn't yes, you? Yes, a very great deal. Not all of it very good. I had great battles with Eliot about it. But I must say, he's, he, if I have any little slender reputation, it's due to his wise choice and his refusal to bow down when I wanted to slip a bad poem in. Was it a great conflict between the writer and the poet? Oh, really, it's all, it's all one and the same thing, because in the absolute analysis, in the final analysis, writing doesn't interest me at all. What I wanted to do was to grow up. Writing was just uh, like a punch bag which happened to be at hand. But it could have been fly fishing. You can grow up anywhere, I now realize. You could do, you can achieve a little bit of uh, information about yourself through any medium. That's where the Japanese are so wise. They don't bore you with metaphysics. They say, take up sword play, learn arranging flowers, do something physical. You could be a boxer and be a hero, too. Was writing easier then? No, it's never, it's never very easy. You have to give yourself a sort of artificial nervous breakdown, and then you communicate the fear, the horror, uh, or the suspense, or whatever, to your reader. But if you're flat, the stuff you're writing tends to be like flat ginger beer, and the reading of it is flat, too. It's a very mysterious thing, because you're passing like a current, or you're passing a current along a wire, so to speak, with your writing, through the eyes of somebody else, and through his appreciating mind, his soul, if you like. So you, get, you, you have to register a certain magnetic wavelength that somebody else can grab. Because fundamentally, you're, in touching on your own terrors and on your own neuroses, you are liberating them, and you're vicariously liberating your reader, too. That's why he finds this magnetic or this splendid or that the other, because it touches his own particular terrors, horrors, neuroses, or whatever. So that's really the secret, I think. Are you a lonely man? Oh, I think the minute you start creating, you know, you cut yourself off from everything. Really? Or you are cut off. It's an umbilical cord that goes. Snap. At night, the fishing boats put out. They carry great carbide flares to attract the fish to the nets. And soon, the dark bulk of the Albanian shadow opposite will be studded with their jeweled fires. Then everything dies down suddenly, and the color washes back into the sky. Evening light mellows very softly into its range of warm lemon tones, pressing among the close bunches of the ripening grapes. 
The cicadas are dying out, station after station closing down. In the east, the color is washing out of the world, leaving room for the great copper-colored moon, which will rise over the virus. It is the magic hour between two unrealized states of being, the day world expiring in its last hot tones of amber and lemon, and the night world gathering with its ink blue shadows and silver moonlight. Endearing and seducing moon, the sky's curvature like an impress of an embrace while she rises, as if in one's own throat, so pure, so glittering. The blue waters of the lagoon invent moonlight and play it back in fountains of crystal. And now the stars are shining down, frost blown and taut upon this pure Euclidean surface. On the edge of the mirror, a wind comes and the whole of heaven stirs and trembles. <laughs> 